there is, um, I guess, a kind of telegram from the Pope. I think it should, have, should be read at the beginning of the New York encounter, so I'm going to read it. It's a brief little thing, maybe written by the chief altar boy at St. Something Cathedral, but anyway, it, it bears the approval of the Pope. It says, Dear Mr. Mariscalco, he runs the whole stuff here. But for some strange reason, he's not speaking to you tonight. Amazing. So, hey, here we go. Dear Mr. Mariscalco and friends of the New York Encounter. I wonder who are the enemies of the New York Encounter. <laughs> As you gather this weekend, at the Manhattan Center to consider the theme experience freedom, His Holiness, Pope Benedict XVI, conveys to all of you, and on this special occasion, his greetings and prayerful good wishes. In the sentiment of the Holy Father, to the sentiment of the Holy Father, I add, my own warm regards, and it's signed for the, by uh, Archbishop Viganio, the uh, nuncio of the Holy Father in the United States. Anyway, that authenticates us. There you are. They ask you, what are you doing? Are you a strange group of people? You are very good. The iPad. If you suddenly see me sitting down like playing a game, <laughs> send somebody to get me up. All right. I have 30 minutes or 20 minutes, something like that, assigned to explain to you the experience of liberty. <laughs> we are really shameless, aren't we? 20 minutes to for a theme and a topic like that. This is a little quickie. Where did I put the... See, things are already disappearing. We are... I was guided in preparing these thoughts by... Uh, the quote in the propaganda that we put out of Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. And inasmuch as we know now the interior language of the Trinity is Spanish, <laughs> and is my native language, as well as the language dominating more and more of the movement every day. I will read to you the text. La libertad, Sancho, es uno de los más preciosos dones que a los hombres dieron los cielos. Con ella no pueden igualarse los tesoros que encierra la tierra ni el mar encubre. Por la libertad, así como Por la honra se puede y se debe aventurar la vida. Y por el contrario, el cautiverio es el mayor mal que puede venir a los hombres. And, and so on. Well, you have, to have most of it translated in the uh, ad. Debe ti as the most precious, among the most precious gifts which the Creator can give human beings. And greater, its worth is greater than anything that the earth and the seas and the air can give us that makes us free. There is always the freedom itself is the greatest of all of these. And then the opposite. 
The worst thing that can happen to us is the loss of freedom. We have been asked to reflect during these three days not a definition about freedom or a theological or philosophical concept, but the experience of freedom. There are people here, among the ones we gathered for presentations and shows, etc., and among the people who are attending, who have had this experience and are anxious to share it. I recommend that as you participate in all of these activities these coming three days, you look for that. You look for people who act in a way that is unexpected, that shows that they are experiencing a reality that they had not before and that you in some way are attracted to. The experience of freedom. You know, and it turns out that the theme, although it was chosen separately, coincides with the theme the bishops of the United States have chosen for this year of faith, you recall, religious freedom. Freedom, but religious freedom. Now, it's really, religious freedom is really freedom. It's the basis of all of the rest of freedom. In a sense, therefore, when we are talking about the experience of freedom, we are always talking about the experience of religious freedom because religious freedom is the experience of freedom dealing with, with, the, uh, with, with, with the destiny of, of my life, with the destiny of my, uh, of my being born. Why, why? The big question. That's to be free to ask that question is religious freedom. And it's the same with the word freedom. So we have the same, the same subject, if you wish, as the church in the United States for this year of faith, according to the bishops. There is another point that is important at the beginning. And that is when we talk about faith in this, we're looking now, obviously, put it this way, obviously the the experience of freedom is one of the fruits of what is classically called grace. Christ sets us free. He died for, to set us free from our sins, etc. It's all over scripture. How fruit is one of the, how freedom is one of the fruits of Christ's work. For us, freedom, therefore, is not a concept not an idea, not a philosopher, not a theology, not a political arrangement, but merely the presence and action of someone. The presence and action of Jesus Christ, risen, died first, of course, risen and triumphantly making himself present. This is very important because it is necessary to insist again and again and again that everything that concerns the Christian faith, as we Catholics understand it, everything, all the benefits, all the threats, everything that concerns the Catholic Church is related to the experience of the presence of someone, someone that comes to you, someone that addresses you, that you can above all address back and speak and use the term you. We are before the great mystery, of course, but we're not silent before the mystery. That's not the kind of relation with the mystic that Jesus recommended to us when he gave us the Our Father. On the contrary, it is a communitarian one, Our Father. And above all, it is one in which we address this mystery as you. That is very important in the discussion that will follow. When we speak, therefore, about faith and freedom, what we really want to know is in what way is the experience of the presence of Christ, in what way does it relate 
to what I can call and know an experience of freedom. Again, I repeat this because I find that most people don't understand and including myself many times. When we say the experience of freedom, we mean, thank you, the experience, if she only knew who it was who asked for water, she would ask me and I would give her living water there. <laughs> to find any convenient moment to quote scripture. In any case, bring your five husbands. <laughs> uh, you see now I ruined these things. Now I have no idea. What I... All right, no. The experience of freedom is, is the experience of, in us, of somebody else to whom we can speak and who speaks to us. Everything having to do with faith in the Christian proposal is, depends, our claims about the effects in us of the presence of Jesus Christ. In an article written by Joseph Ratzinger, uh, this is before, a few years ago, he is no longer a professor wherever he was at that time. I don't know what he's doing these days. He's got another job. <laughs> professor Ratzinger wrote an article about freedom and truth. And uh, I looked it up. And uh, in it he claims that freedom is the theme that most characterizes modernity. Freedom, those are the exact words, it's a quote, is the theme that most characterizes modernity. We could also say that freedom is the term that characterizes the thing Americans mostly care of, about, care about the American dream. Isn't the American dream the achievement of freedom from everything that stands in the way of personal development. So, the topic, the experience of freedom, is very relevant, very interesting, because it deals with the great questions that we experience in our hearts both as human beings, as global citizens, and as Americans. An understanding of how freedom is related to faith is like a light cast on the point of encounter between faith and culture, between a divine person and the fruit of all our efforts to construct a truly human world. Doing my reading again from this perspective, I came across, across the phenomena, which is it's always funny because it's always easier to examine, to examine something from the negative side. That's why, you know, uh, I once found one book completely boring, but it was on, it was on the virtues. Oh, God. <laughs> I can't stand virtue talk. But the same book came out with a title on the vices. I loved it, it was excellent, I'm glad I read it. <laughs> so I thought I would look not for the experience of freedom, but look first for the experience of the lack of freedom. What is it like? Where is it found? Where can it be measured? Where can it be discovered, this lack of freedom? In so doing, I thought of the expression, a cultural, a, a cultural virus that lives within us. It shows itself with the intention, the work of this virus is to, to reduce our freedom Therefore, to separate the life of faith 
from the life of freedom. But since we saw that faith is the experience of a person, then I can say that what this virus wants to do is to separate this person from our selves, from our deepest selves, to separate Christ, to disincarnate Christ, this cultural virus. And how does it do it? How does the virus attack the incarnation? Not by attacking the divinity, but by attacking the humanity. First of all, it's easier to attack the humanity than to attack a divinity. But most important, the genius of this virus is that it knows that if, we, if it splits Christ from our humanity, by diminishing the capacities of our humanity to experience freedom, it will succeed. If it attacks directly the freedom that comes from Christ, it will fail. So we are looking for moments in which the experience of Christ is separated from the experience of a liberating presence. How is that done though? How can that happen inside of me? I should be able to catch it. I should be able to say, aha, no, no, I will not be deceived. This, uh, what is the particular attraction that this inhuman way of thinking and of judging makes me follow? It is this by changing the meaning of the words. The Christian vocabulary remains untouched. Faith, love, hope, freedom. What has changed is the meaning of these words. These words no longer symbolize what they once did, no longer convey the experience to which they once referred. On the contrary, many times the use of the word conveys the very opposite of what it did. That is one of the things about freedom. We use and hear and talk about the word freedom this day and many times we're talking about the very opposite of freedom. This crushing of meaning is equivalent to a diminishment in, the, in our capacity as human beings, precisely the capacity not to be deceived by such a proposal, the capacity to recognize real freedom. This capacity is diminished in us, and in so doing, our humanity itself is reduced. It is one of the most important points because this allows us to directly investigate the virus just to see in us, at work, how we do it with an open mind to our activity. How do we change the meaning of the words to their opposite and in this way diminish our humanity? Today, the Holy Father maintains, we maintain too, humanity is diminished like never before. The cultural virus is strong. It's like the flu that's going around. One would hope that there would be some kind of vaccine and maybe there is something here and there. But basically, Christ is being removed from humanity. Once again, 
we care about this with all due respect to Christ because of what it's doing to our humanity. Christ can defend himself. We, we are being destroyed as human beings. We live at a time in which everybody at all levels of human existence says, and let's say recognizes, that the great issue of the day is the issue of human rights. That we need a consensus of the global level of what human rights are and where they originate. And this is being discussed in the United Nations and so forth, something to replace the President Declaration. In any case, we maintain that human rights, the dignity of the human person, the dignity of the human being, lies precisely in this capacity to detect a diminishment in our humanity that is coming many times disguised as the opposite, as an increase in our human capacities. So this, is, this, uh, this topic is not just piety, it has immense political, for example, uh, applications, or as we will see in some of the guests that, will, that are around anyway. Finally, reading still about freedom, you will encounter in the Confessions, no, in the City of God by St. Augustine, that he divides human beings into two interior attitudes towards life. The first one is presumption. The second one is conversion. Presumption is the conviction that we can fix our problems by ourselves, that all we need is the intelligence and the strength of will, and we can take care of all human problems of everything that threatens the humanity, our humanity as such. Confession is a recognition of our poverty, that that is not true, that in fact we need to be saved from this. We need a strength to come to us and that there is such a strength and that we have found such a strength. That is why it is a confession. Remember that was the title of one of Augustine's greatest books, The Confessions. It is the proclamation of the reality of a force that conquers the cultural virus, sets us free to be human as we were meant to be. I would simply say then, by summary, that the experience of freedom is the experience of being a contemplative as you look at reality and marvel and wonder and praise God and protect it and develop it with the respect that it requires so you can see the beauty that attracts our freedom. Thank you very much. So, now we are going to watch a video. This is a video of an interview made almost five years ago with an inmate in the state prison in North Carolina, Mr. Joshua Stansel. One day, more precisely on October 7, 2002, the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, a member of the Catholic movement that organizes this New York encounter, Communion and Liberation, received an email message from this woman. She was asking us for some publications in English by Father Luigi Giussani. Just like out of nowhere, we didn't know this lady, and she knew that Giussani was the founder of Communion and Liberation, and so 
she wanted us to tell her where she could find these books so that she could send these books to her son in prison. The reason of this unusual request was that her son was intrigued, intrigued by someone, or so, sorry, by some writings of Giussani that he had read in a copy of the Magnificat that miraculously, one would say, had ended up in the prison in North Carolina. We had to look up to you to see if uh, at any time Father Peter Cameron was in jail <laughs> and left behind some uh, Magnificat. Anyway, a Magnificat appeared and, and this guy read it and uh, was intrigued with the reference to Father Giussani and the movement. As a result, Joshua, instead of books, started to receive practically every week, every weekend, from the year 2001 until now, until this very week, to receive visits from different people in the Communion and Liberation Movement as the friendship with them develops. We are proposing this video because Joshua in prison recognizes and will tell us the real freedom in the terms I have just illustrated. After the video, we'll read a letter he wrote for today's event, for precisely this moment, which shows you how this journey inwards uh, of him how, has led to a freedom that has deepened in all these years. So I better get out of here. Ooh, a pen. We are with Joshua Stencil. How old are you, Mr. Stencil? I am 37. How many years have you been here? Uh, 12. And how many years? Do you have to stay here? I have six remaining. Six? Six. Uh, can you tell us how is your day like? I mean, briefly, what's the schedule of your day? Uh, well, they get us up about uh, six o'clock. There's a count. They count us periodically throughout the day to make sure that, you know, we haven't jumped a fence and, you know, gone to Mexico. But um, they get up around six and they serve breakfast shortly thereafter. And depending on what your job assignment is or school assignment, you'll take off a short time after that, somewhere around 8 or 9 o'clock. I cut grass, so uh, it being the summertime, we try to uh, get started as early as possible. So we go ahead and eat breakfast, come back, and um, you know, get, the, get the equipment and start mowing. How many, how many people are there in this, in this facility, in this prison? I think there's about 750, nice. 700 or so. How long have you been here? It's a Just short a, time. Tomorrow will be one month. How many prisons have you, have you spent time? This is my time? fifth. The, the fifth one? Fifth one. Uh, there, are, there are people, there are inmates, not just here, but everywhere in the world that have the experience of Italy, for example, that consider the prison kind of a tomb, a grave. Yeah. Uh, it is not like this for you, for what I understand. Why, why it is not? I'm a fan of the poet uh, William Butler Yeats, and in one of his, his poems he said uh, something along the lines of, too great a sacrifice can make a stone of a man's heart. And I think for a lot of inmates that happens because they're not made aware of the importance of, of sacrifice and uh, the meaning of sacrifice. And I was the same way. Uh, the first few years of prison I was sort of bitter and angry about receiving such a long sentence. And I was bitter and angry at myself, you know, mostly for my actions. Um, but I, I hit a point where sort of the bottom fell out and I was uh, transferred to a, to a prison that was particularly uh, chaotic. And I personally never had any problems there, but just the environment just seemed um, demonic in a, in a way, and I know it's a word we're not supposed to use now because we're all you know, so enlightened, but 
it just seemed oppressively evil in, in a way. And, uh, and I, I began to really doubt you know, any kind of higher purpose, any kind of higher power. And I thought, you know, this is what human beings really are. You know, this the nice talk about Jesus and, and that's like a, you know, a, a nice suit we put on to go out to dinner. But in reality, when you take everything away from a man, this is what he becomes. You know, this is what life really, this is reality. And uh, I was struck by something that Jasani had said. I read a little excerpt there, Magnificat, and he said, the primitive church was not a place for perfect people. And for whatever reason, that was transformative you know, to me in my understanding of my environment. And I actually began to look at some of the people I was around uh, with you know, a sense of compassion, that I am connected to them in some way. It, you know, at, a, at a basic level, I want the same things that they want, even if they're not aware of really yet what it is that they want. Um, and I be, through my encounter with, with the people in, in CL, I, you know, I became aware of what, uh, of what sacrifice is and that it doesn't matter really the environment, you can always say, I am. And if I say that I am, I'm saying in essence I'm created and uh, that someone else is making me at this moment. And I am not completely untethered from the rest of humanity, that there is still a connection in my heart. You know, beats uh, for the same things that the next the next man's heart beats for. Uh, how would you describe the, the 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 idea of freedom being in in a prison? I mean, is it possible to be free uh, when you are spending a good part of your life uh, in a, in a place like this? Sure. Um, if if one is aware, and I think for all too many inmates, male and female, that there's just not that awareness. Um, prisons in America tend to be overcrowded and understaffed, and um, uh, you know depression sets in, and it's it's easy to to fall away if you don't have someone there constantly telling you. I'm fortunate in that through all these people, I, I do have that. Uh, I give an example recently. The last prison I was at, uh, one of my duties as a medical janitor was to clean up uh, blood after fights. And right before I transferred to this prison, there was a, a particularly brutal fight that I had to go clean up blood. And um, usually when I enter a block to, to clean up the blood, there's a lot of chatter. It's, everyone's excited. There's been a fight. You know, something's happened. But it was dead silent. Uh, three inmates had jumped another inmate and had beat him so badly he had to be taken to the hospital. And ordinarily I could clean up the blood with just a rag and, and some bleach, but I had to get a mop. I mean, it was, there were puddles, and it was on the wall, splashed. And it was just dead silent. And the only thing you could hear was just the sound of the mop, you know, swishing back and forth on the floor. And I, I really became uh, depressed at that moment, and I, and I asked, why, God? <laughs> what, what did I ever do in my life to deserve this? all of this. And uh, I was really down for a couple of days. A couple of days later, I received in the mail a letter from a group of kids, children of friends in the movement. Uh, it was a school group, and they had a list of questions for me, and they wanted to know about my experience in, in prison. And uh, I was so struck by this, I thought, you know, these kids, they're not, I mean, I'm a guy in prison, that they're not afraid. They're asking me questions. And they're expecting an answer. They're asking why. But unlike me, they're expecting an answer. My why was not a genuine question. It was more like a shaken fist, you know, an accusation. Theirs was an actual question. And so again, I asked that question. It was the exact same question that I asked several days earlier. Why, Lord? What did I ever do to deserve this? And, uh, so that connection with other people, it's the same question, but a different understanding of that question. And all too many men in here just don't have that, that constant reminder. Earlier I was asking you about what, uh, how can you say that you are a free man? What is freedom being in prison? And I was wondering, what is that sustain your hope? Uh, looking toward the future, what, how is your hope uh, sustained by this experience? And what is that? 
What is hope for you? There's a passage in one of Paul's letters, and I forget which one, where there's a little prayer, and, and it says that, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but that I feel confident that God will finish this work that he has started in you. And when I look at uh, the last five or six years of my encounter with the movement and the people of the movement, and the number of coincidences, um, I took a, a philosophy course, and uh, one of its arguments was that coincidence cannot be seen as a proof of God's existence. Okay, but after a while, coincidence after coincidence, uh, it adds up to design, and it's no longer in my opinion, just coincidence. Now, you see that in the universe, you see that in science, and you see that in, in individual lives. I see that in my life. And it seems impossible to me that the revolution that, I like, that I've experienced in my own life um, is for no purpose at all. And being free in prison means, being free means not being a slave to every circumstance. And uh, I'm not a slave to this circumstance. My happiness is not contingent upon barbed wire and concrete walls. When I leave prison, uh, my happiness will not be contingent upon uh, you know, a particular house or a particular car or a particular job. Um, if it is, then I've become a slave to that, that circumstance. That to me is being free. Um, good evening, in case you're wondering where I popped up from. Um, <laughs> my name is Tony Hendra, and um, I, I am here because I know Riro very well, and also because um, we met, uh, because he, he and I think in general, New York Encounter enjoyed my book, Father Joe. So um, I'm going to do a couple of readings, one of which is uh, a letter which New York Encounter received from Joshua uh, just about a week ago, which I think speaks very clearly and in a very wide-ranging manner to the subject of freedom. Nash Correctional Institute, January the 8th, 2013. I stopped by the prison library and discovered that someone had do donated a copy of The God Delusion by renowned British scientist and weirdly intemperate atheist, Richard Dawkins. I had wanted to read the book since its publication in 2006 and had hoped for something invigorating and challenging. Plowing through his manifesto, I quickly realized that Dawkins' argument is no more serious than those of other media-styled new atheists, though he makes it appear so by dressing it up in a scientific tuxedo. What struck me most about the book, however, is Dawkins' strangely dismissive view of beauty. But then maybe this is not so strange. Beauty is the arrow in the theist's quiver that flies most surely. The atheist will, will just as surely want to continue moving the target. In a 463-page book, Dawkins devotes only four paragraphs to beauty, a phenomenon he pooh-poohs as vacuous. I closed the book after the final page and wondered if he really believes such a thing and what his life must be like if he does. Disappointed, I returned the book to the library. The following night, I phoned my friend, Michelle, who lives in Manhattan. Immediately, she said, can you listen to music? I heard the tink and click of her iPhone being set down. Then I heard music, beautiful music. Michelle was sitting at her piano playing a selection by Franz Schubert. Our connection wasn't particularly good, as the phones here were apparently installed by Alexander Graham Bell himself. But even over the static and pop of the archaic phone cable, the beauty of the music was obvious and pointed me on to something else. This was not sentimentality. The cinder block walls of the prison still stand. The razor wire still coils snake-like atop the perimeter fencing. The cafeteria meatloaf still possesses an alarmingly orange tinge. 
but in the gift of my friend's music, I can recognize very clearly that my life is not defined or bound by these things. I was and remain truly free in a very real sense, free from what Chesterton called the tyranny of circumstance. Reality is always good because reality, as my dear friend Rose told me not long ago, is always more and it resists our attempts to reduce it. Natural selection can explain a great many things, and I don't, def I don't fault Dr. Dawkins for appealing to it when appropriate, but it can offer no... Well, that seemed pretty random. <laughs> Not the product of evolution at all. Um, anyway, Dr. Dawkins appealing to evolution may do so when appropriate, but it can offer no convincing rationale for Franz Schubert's need to scribble music on a lined paper or for Michel's need to incarnate those scribbled music notes 200 years later with a run of her fingers over the black and white keys of her piano, or for my deep wonder, while incarcerated, in listening to the two of them cooperate across the expanse of two centuries. From a purely rationalistic point of view, the whole thing is a bit nutty, but it's very human and points us beyond ourselves if, in our freedom, we allow it to. Oh, which reminds me. Sometime before the interlude at the piano, I passed through the cell block day room and glanced up at the TV. Some kind of prime time soap opera was on in which the oblivious characters are consigned to a perpetual derby of erotic conquest and material acquisition. There may have been some vampires involved too. Uh, I can't be sure nowadays everything has to have some vampires. The writing wasn't awful, but I couldn't help noticing how skittery and dis dissatisfied the characters all were, despite their being portrayed as liberated and free young adults of the new millennium. No one truly loved. No one truly was loved. In the hermetically sealed universe of this TV show, freedom was portrayed as an absence of ties, a radical individualism whose one goal is personal gain. Even in the character's heated couplings, of which there were many, there was never a pretense made of true union being sought, much less attained. After an hour of this, I was slightly depressed. I realized that the universe of this TV show is not hermetically sealed, and that its hampering spirit has infected the culture at large and dominates it like a virus. After a few minutes of contemplation, though, I felt an immense gratitude for my friends, for I realized that had I not come to prison and providentially encountered them, I would at this moment labor under the same erroneous notion of freedom as the characters on TV and would never know true freedom and thus never know true love. Can one be grateful for prison, for rehab, for cancer, for the pain of infidelity, for personal weakness, for trials of any kind? Seventeen years ago, I would have, would have answered no. But now, I mean, it still feels a little weird to, weird to say it, like maybe I should whisper it, but the answer is yes. For in every circumstance, I can affirm an other. In every circumstance, I can offer. In every circumstance, I can say you. And I can do so with certainty in the ultimate goodness of reality even when the appearance of reality is so ugly as to shock me into silence. The third Sunday in Advent this year occurred two days after the horrific school shooting in Connecticut. That Sunday morning, five of us gathered at our usual table in the cell block to go over the mass readings for the day and to drink some coffee and talk. The, th the third Sunday readings are always the most joyous of the season and for that reason were a serious provocation this year. One verse from the Hebrew scriptures struck us as particularly difficult to reconcile with the events of recent days. You will have no, mis you will have no further misfortune to fear. Zephaniah 3.15. Really? These are nice words, of course, but quite clearly they tell a monstrous lie. No further misfortune? Just look around. 
Human existence is practically a farmer's market of further misfortune. Relationships fray, marriages turn cold, businesses fail, and destitution ensues. Personal ideals crumble, affection goes unrequited. Great men and women are brought low by petty weakness. Natural disasters wreak havoc. Loved ones get sick and die. No further misfortune? Is this not the most intellectually insulting verse in all the Bible? Is Richard Dawkins not right off after all in considering beauty a vacuous and ultimately illusory byproduct of an inherently random and meaningless progress, process of natural selection? We talked a great deal about this, and eventually someone pointed out that we were misreading the text. It doesn't say you will have no further misfortune to bear. Rather, it says you will have no further misfortune to fear. One cannot, cannot acknowledge the reality of misfortune without also at least tac tacitly recognizing the reality of fortune. Evil is not a thing, but an absence, and thereby indicates in spite of itself the reality of a presence. And it is this presence, as comfortable and close to me as my friends, that supports me in every circumstance and allows me to say, you. Theodore Rotka once asked, what's freedom for? And he answered, to know eternity. From my own experience, I would simply add that eternity entered human time and took on a human face became a human presence, and that I can encounter this presence through my friends. Paradoxically, it is only by following that I realize my freedom. Thank you, Joshua. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm going to um, complete this evening's um, meditations by uh, another reading, this time from um, a French poet called Charles Peggy. Peggy was, um, was a poet of the, the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. And um, he was, for most of his life, a, a convinced socialist. But in 1908, he became, uh, quite suddenly, I believe, um, a devout Roman Catholic. Um, and he was uh, subs subsequently killed in the first year of the First World War. This poem is called Freedom, and it's from the Mystery of the Holy Innocents. God speaks. I don't want any misunderstanding here. I am not God. Uh, I'm just playing him on television. God speaks. When you love someone, you love him as he is. I alone am perfect. It is probably for that reason that I know what perfection is and that I demand less perfe perfection of those poor people. I know how difficult it is. And how often when they are struggling in their trials, how often do I wish and am I tempted to put my hand under their stomachs in order to hold them up with my big hand, just like a father teaching his son how to swim in the current of the river, and who is divided between two ways of thinking. For on the one hand, if he holds him up all the time, and if he holds him too much, the child will depend on this, and will never learn how to swim. But if he doesn't hold him up just at the right moment, that child is bound to swallow more water than is healthy for him. In the same way, when I teach them how to swim amid their trials, I too am divided by two ways of thinking. Because if I am always holding them up, if I hold them up too often, they will never learn how to swim by themselves. But if I don't hold them up at just the right moment, perhaps those poor children will swallow more water than is healthy for them. 
Such is the difficulty, and it is a great one. And such is the doubleness itself, the two faces of the problem. On the one hand, they must work out their salvation for themselves. That is the rule. It allows of no exception. Otherwise, it would not be interesting. They would not be men. Now I want them to be manly, to be men, and to win by themselves their spurs of knighthood. On the other hand, they must not swallow more water than is healthy for them, having made a dive into the ingratitude of sin. Such is the mystery of man's freedom, says God, and the mystery of my government toward him and towards his freedom. If I hold him up too much, he is no longer free. And if I don't hold him up sufficiently, I am endangering his salvation. Two goods, in a sense, almost equally precious, for salvation is of infinite price. But what kind of salvation would a salvation be that was not free? What would you call it? We want that salvation to be acquired by himself, himself, man, to be procured by himself, to come, in a sense, from himself. Such is the secret. Such is the mystery of man's freedom. Such is the price we set on man's freedom. Because I myself am free, says God, and I have created man in my own image and likeness, such is the mystery, such the secret, such the price of all freedom. The freedom of that creature is the most beautiful reflection in this world of the creator's freedom. That is why we are so attached to it and set a proper price on it. A salvation that was not free, that was not, that did not come from a free man, could in no wise be attractive to us. What would it amount to? What would it mean? What interest would such salvation have to offer? A beatitude of slaves, a salvation of slaves, a slavish beatitude. How do you expect me to be interested in that kind of thing? Does one care to be loved by slaves? If it were only a matter of proving my might, my might has no need of those slaves. My might is well enough known. It is sufficiently known that I am the Almighty. My might is manifest enough in all matter and in all events. My might is manifest enough in the sands of the sea and in the stars of the heavens. It is not questioned, it is known, it is manifest enough in inanimate creation. It is manifest enough in the government, in the very event that is man. But in my creation, which is imbued with life, says God, I wanted something more, infinitely better infinitely more. I wanted that freedom. I created that very freedom. There are several degrees to my throne. When once you have known what it is to be loved freely, submission no longer has any taste. All the prostrations in the world are not worth the beautiful upright attitude of a free man as he kneels. All the submission all the dejection in the world are not equal in value to the soaring up point, the beautiful straight soaring up of one single invocation from a love that is free. For this freedom, for this gratuitousness, I sacrificed everything, says God. For this pleasure I have of being loved by free men, freely, gratuitously, by true men, Virile, adult, solid, noble, tender, but with a solid tenderness. To obtain this freedom, this gratuitousness, I sacrificed everything. To create this freedom, this gratuitousness, to call into play this freedom, this gratuitousness, to teach them what freedom is, I sacrificed everything. Thank you. And thank you, Monsignor.